So just want to welcome everyone who's made it into the room. And I know um, Chelsea will be letting people in. Um, just to get started, my name is Michelle Rogers. I'm an associate professor in the College of Computing and Informatics on the information science side. And we're going to give you a little bit of an overview. Want to welcome you to the, the presentation. Then I'm going to introduce Santa Bar. <laughs> and Santa Bar will introduce our speaker. And we'll um, run the discussion from there and finish up right around 1230. So just to give you a welcome and introduce you to the uh, Women in Tech program, if you haven't heard about it, is that um, in 2017, we launched a major strategic initiative by the college to grow the number of women students across the college. And last year, we changed from women in computing to women in tech because we wanted to make sure that we reached out to all women involved in any kind of technology and not limit it to computing. So this initiative is centered around recruitment and retention of women in the undergraduate majors. So our goal really was to increase the women students in CCI by 50% in five years. So we have a couple years left to go to reach that goal, but we've kind of already reached it and we're really excited about that and want to keep up those numbers. So uh, we've joined partners with many different organizations in order to use this moment in history of technology and education to advance um, the role of women in technology and across higher education and industry. So as I finish up on my time, just if anybody has any questions about that, please um, put those in the chat. Uh, and before I move on, I want to introduce Sanobar. Uh, she's a data science major with a, my, a minor in biology. She came to the U.S. from India um, about six years ago, and now she's in her third, fourth year at Drexel. Um, very passionate about her women in computing, uh, the Women in Tech Initiative, and um, one of her hobbies is playing badminton and swimming. So uh, you may have seen her around campus because she has an identical twin sister. And so feel free to, to, to check her out. But now Santa Barbara is going to introduce our speaker and get the discussion going. Yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Uh, Dr. Rogers has been one of my teachers and mentors throughout my journey at CCI. So I really appreciate her being here as well. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Carly. She is a senior data scientist at Vanguard. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Carly. And just wanted to let our audience know um, that at any time, feel free to put your questions in the comments chat section and I will address them. Hi, Carly. How are you? Hey, nice, nice to be here. And be with everyone. Awesome. So let's get started with our questions. Um, the first question is, can you give us a brief overview of your professional experience? Yeah, so right now I'm a senior data scientist at Vanguard. Uh, been there for a few years, started as a, a regular data scientist, and I'm in the FinTech Strategies group at Vanguard in the investment management group. So what that is, is almost like a miniature innovation type team that is on the same floor as traders and portfolio managers, where um, we bring data science and machine learning concepts to the desk, which is really exciting. That's amazing, yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what you do as your uh, work responsibilities at Vanguard, right? Could you talk about one project that you're really um, excited about that you've done in the past at Vanguard? Yeah, so one of the projects that I first, when I first joined Vanguard that I worked on uh, was to predict the price of a newly issued municipal bond. So municipal bonds will come to market and people won't always know what they should be priced. So I worked with a trader who trades these, a quant who has all of the background on um, what they are and how to price them. And I came in as the kind of machine learning expert. And the three of us created one of the first machine learning models that got implemented on the desk. So that was really exciting. And um, it was one of those, the projects that, it was a fairly stereotypical machine learning process where you choose the features, find your data, test your models, but it had a really good story because it just, it just worked, which was great. Um, and so organization, including the CIO, you know, of these different models, how machine learning could be used and even how something that could be so um, difficult to interpret, we we're able to interpret, explain it to folks, at least enough for traders to believe the model, which is nice. 
That's amazing. So how did you kind of like get into machine learning or data science? Uh, what was your beginning step into getting into it? Because I know a lot of uh, our students, uh, um, they kind of are introduced into computer science, but data science is still something that is not associated with computing. How did you kind of step into that field? Yeah, so my background's kind of kind of all over the place. So um, maybe I'll take a step back and start start there. So I went to um, a, a trade school for culinary arts. I thought I was going to be a chef, and then I decided to go to college for um, event planning. But uh, I got I figured you know business administration would be a good enough degree for event planning, and realized that I really liked math. So I became an industrial and systems engineer uh, for my undergrad. Um, really because I took it out of a hat and there was three engineering majors and I chose one um, that was fairly flexible. And in that program, I took uh, some operations research courses. Operations research is kind of, if you think Google Maps, where you choose one destination and find another, it's the algorithm that finds those shortest distances. So that was kind of my introduction to the first type of data science um, principles. And I took some coding in my undergrad and I decided to go to grad school for um, originally operations research. Mm -hmm. The first course I took was called Introduction to Computational Social Science. And I thought it was an introductory course, I can do it. And one week I didn't, I had never heard of Python. And the next week I was coding Python in AWS doing MapReduce and these like huge algorithms. And it was, it was really hard mm -hmm. um, and I loved it. And so then I took every course in that department um, even though I, I never even knew what data science was before I came into grad school. So it really was a, a path that just kind of happened where I took one course that sounded interesting and, and kept going. Um, the, right. Oh, did I lose you for a second? Sorry. Um, yeah. But, so it was really great because um, they have a lot of really applied courses. And so I was able to kind of apply my math background that I had to these different coding coding challenges. So that's how I got involved with it. That's amazing. Um, I didn't know you had like such a diverse experience. I think some of us just like switch from computer science or like IS, but like you can give us the hope that um, you can be of so many different paths, but still end up at like data science as your um, kind of field with all of that other domain knowledge that you have. Um, so in grad school, what was the setting like? Because I know when I first walked into my computer science or data science class, there were a lot of men in the class and I was a little intimidated because I was like one of the very few women. What was your experience like with that? So there definitely is, uh, there definitely are mostly men, um, especially depending on the class that you take. Some, you know, it would, it would dr vary dramatically. Uh, my grad school did a, did a pretty good job of having a good dispersion of women, but um, it definitely was something where I've normally been one of a few women in, in the area. Luckily, you know, I've never had I too, many, too many problems with like with that or no one made me feel different, which has been really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely helpful because uh, like sometimes it's either a hit or a miss with uh, what college or organization you go with in terms of the ratio of women. Um, were you involved in any like clubs or activities during undergrad or grad school that was towards women in computing or not either, either or it works? Yeah, so in undergrad, I was part of a few different organizations. So I was part of the Industrial, Industrial Systems Engineering Club, Tau Beta Pi, a society of women engineers, uh, different clubs like that. So um, that was really great and made me meet women from you know, all over and really support the cause. And in graduate school, um, I wasn't in as many clubs, but uh, heard about the Women in Data Science Initiative and really started uh, working with that initiative, um, especially when I came to industry. Right, and you were a Women in Data Science ambassador for the Philadelphia um, region, right? Can you tell us more about that experience, please? Yeah, so the Women in Data Science is an initiative started out by Stanford that works to connect uh, data scientists worldwide and focusing on women. So the conferences get held in, from places to Saudi Arabia to California to Texas, you know, all over. And um, the, the, all the speakers at the conference have to be women. Anyone can attend, but 
it's a really great time to have you know, women data scientists shine and, and connect and meet each other. So um, some folks, you know, we, Drexel's one of our, our big partners. We've been all planning a conference that was supposed to happen in March. It'll, it'll be happening next year on International Women's Day now, but a conference that promotes women across industries in data science and really just goes to connect people together and show work. So that's been a really great thing to be a part of. Yep, definitely. And I know Drexel has a lot of different programs to support women in computing, women in tech. So that definitely helps. I'm bummed that because of these unprecedented times that, you know, it had to be moved, but looking forward to it next year, definitely. Um, okay, so one of the questions that we had uh, prior to registration from one of the women um, was how can women support other women in tech and how can we support women of color in tech? So the best way to support other women in, in tech is to, you know, promote each other's work and help, help out. So, you know, some of these initiatives that I have been a part of, it's about hearing people across industry and across experience and, you know, they have things to learn. You know, I've learned so much from people who work in different areas. And so the, to support like women and women of color, it's really just to show their work because every, like, there's so many smart people, you know, and sometimes people can just be hidden, you know, maybe someone's a little bit more shy to talk or, you know, and so um, like at, at Vanguard, a lot of the times, you know, I'll try to help like promote, promote people's work or, you know, especially if I see someone who, who needs it or if someone's struggling, just kind of reaching out a hand, I think that's the best way to, to really promote it. And other ways is just to give areas for people to show their work. Um, you know, whether it's as students, you probably have times where the club has you show your projects, or your capstones, and, you know, at the Women in Data Science Conference, you know, just we try to get people from all over uh, diverse backgrounds to just share what are you working on and, um, I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like, what advice would you give to students who want to get into data science, especially women? So the data science, everyone comes from such a diverse background and you never really know what's going to be helpful for your job until you're there. So the ideal background is a combination of, you know, data science, like modeling and data engineering, being able to get the data you need and put it up and, and use it and the subject matter expertise, whatever that may be. You know, in my case, it's finance, other cases, it may be something else. But if you have a diverse background to be able to code, know math and, know, and be able to understand and learn subject matter expertise, that's the best background. But the best way to kind of get into data science is really just to show employers that you are really smart and you're capable and you can learn something if they throw it at you. Because, you know, when I started, you know, I looked at the requirements of the job and I was like, I knew a quarter of them. But when I got on the job, I did a really good job because you can spend the time to learn it and if you pick up things quickly. So I guess my biggest advice is don't be worried if you don't know all of the qualifications. Just make sure to tell your employers that you can learn them and, you know, know that yourself. Yep, definitely. And did internships really help with that experience? Uh, did you have any internships uh, as a part of your undergrad career? And um, how did they kind of help you get more into the space? Yeah, so I have had internships. Uh, my career path bounced all, all over. So I've had a few different internships over my, my time. So I, I worked at the Chamber of Commerce for a little while where I was doing event planning. Um, and Shiseido, which is a cosmetics company where I was an industrial engineer on the production line. Um, or at Lockheed Martin, I worked on satellites. Um, so I had internships that had really nothing to do with each other or where I am now, but we're all really good at learning experiences to learn, you know, what people in industry do, how, you know, how projects and how I should like hold myself accountable for what I'm working on. And so I think that internships are really helpful. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had a lot of research experience with data science, but not necessarily internships in data science. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what you do, I would highly recommend internships. It just teaches you a lot about, you know, how to hold yourself, what's, what 
you should be working on, how projects are, or even, you know, I had a civil engineering internship once mm -hmm. and that showed me I, I didn't want to do civil engineering and that's a really good outcome. So, um, I mean, it's a, an outcome, but at least I didn't, you know, spend a few years as a civil engineer before I found that out. That definitely makes sense. Yeah. And I think like that's why a lot of people are attracted to Drexel because of their co-op opportunities and how like the six month experience can kind of help you decide that you want to go into this career path or choose another career path, which is pretty interesting to me. Um, and so through that, do you have any advice for students who are just going to start their co-ops or who are going to give interviews about um, a data scientist role that they aren't really too sure about? Um, just any advice that you might have for them? Yeah, so for people who are interviewing, you know, just be yourself and be nice. And it's okay if you don't know every question. You know, there's been questions I've been asked on an interview where I've admitted, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but I'd be happy to learn. But that's also one of the most important things is to show your employers that you're willing to learn because you have the, you know, Drexel's program is so strong. You have the knowledge to be able to do the project. It's just a matter of, um, of showing the employer that. And so, but with that, some advice for, you know, interviews is make sure you know what company you're interviewing for. You know, I've had, I've done interviews with folks who didn't know what Vanguard was and, you know, that's okay. But if you show, if you do a little bit of research up front and have something that you've seen in the news that's interesting about that company recently, that goes a long way. Um, and for advice for people who are in a co-op or about to be in a co-op, you know, First impressions really count, you know, show up on, on day one on time. I'm very big with, with being on time. Um, and, you know, show up on time with a smile on your face, ready to learn and bring a notebook or, you know, a computer, you know, those you're probably starting online, but jot down notes. The most helpful things in my internships when I was doing them was I took notes about everything, even day one, people's names. And mm -hmm. no one will mind if you have a notebook in front of you or if you're taking notes, everyone really appreciates that actually. So that those are probably some of my biggest advice. Yeah, definitely. Plus like one-on-one -on -one interviews like these and like um, different companies and like just trying to get to know people is something that's really helpful as well. Um, thank you for that. Um, so based on that, um, I know like for first timers going from like a student experience into like a work experience, uh, some people might struggle with a work life balance. How do you uh, strive to maintain that work life balance or what fun things do you do outside of work? Yeah, so in the beginning of working, uh, my first few months, I was definitely working a lot more because mm -hmm. I took the train out to work. And so I was dominated by the train schedule and was always doing a very early one and a very late one. And um, after I got my bearings and new people, I realized that I didn't actually have to be there as long as I thought. So I started making my day a lot more normal of a day and it worked out great. You know, it was some days you have a long, a long day. Some days you have a short day, you know, on a Friday in the summer, if, if you want to leave early, you know, most employers are, are willing to work with you. So the way that I really work with work-life balance is I like to be outside a lot. So I guess an example that I can use now is, you know, during this quarantine where everyone's stuck at home, a lot of times, you know, the work day seems like it can never end. So a lot of times at, at five or six, I cut off and I, I go on a run or I go on a walk and I leave my phone at home. And right. so um, I try to do things to keep it. But luckily, it, Vanguard makes it very easy for the work-life balance. Um, I haven't had too much of a problem with that. And then for hobbies, I'm, I love to swim like you. Um, not as good of a badminton player, though. But then I really like um, volleyball and hiking. So pretty much anything outside. I'm not particularly good at one of them, but um, I always like to try. Yeah, I think anything like especially exercise or anything that like takes your mind off of things and like helps you distract away from work is something that's really important. I look at my mom working like 24 seven. She uh, she's a team lead at uh, Fox Rehab and she just won't stop working. I'm like, mom, you need to calm down, take a break, have some work life balance, even though your kids are in college now. It's, it's important. Um, yeah, definitely. And so in terms of um, mid-career, so if people want to kind of uh, be data scientists or beginners and want to go into a senior level position, what advice do you have for them? And how do you work towards that goal? I think that the, 
the biggest help, the biggest thing that I probably did to go into a more senior position is um, being able to explain your work to folks who don't understand anything about it. So you could make the best model in the world, but if someone doesn't believe in it, it'll never get, um, it'll never get used. So, you know, with all of your classes, while you're, while you're doing this, make sure to understand the ins and outs of your models to be able to, to explain them to, you know, your sibling or some, someone who doesn't know anything about data science, because um, as you become more senior, sometimes it, that's what you really need is, is the buy-in from people who don't know anything about data science. And um, so practicing presentations or, you know, interviewing, things like that is, is really helpful. Um, to do that. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. And I'm looking at the chat, everyone in the audience, please let Carly know if you have any questions um, and I'll refer to that. Um, so in general, like if anybody's struggling with coding, especially like uh, we use Python or R, uh, those type of languages, what do you, uh, what advice do you want to give to them? I know that I've uh, like struggled with coding a lot in the beginning. That's why I was kind of deciding to change majors at one point because it can get hard. So um, did you have any of those experiences and how did you kind of overcome them? Yeah, so I learned coding through R in the beginning. Um, and so I took a pretty hands-on course called the Data Challenge Lab that was two hours every day of just coding in R with a homework assignment every night besides Saturday. Mm -hmm. And um, we use this, this online free textbook called R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham. And it's like, if you Google R4DS, it shows up. And that has really good walkthrough tutorials of how to do um, any coding you really need to do in R, which is really helpful. For Python, I have learned it more on the job. Um, once you learn one language, it's, it's relatively easy. Definitely a lot of hiccups and bumps and Googles along the way, but of so I've learned a lot of Python on the job, so I don't have as much of a, of a good way to do that. But what's really interesting about industry that is different than school is you're allowed to look up things. You know, in my projects, I can Google, if I forget a function, it's not, it's not an exam. So just, you know, read a lot about it, try some type of applied project and, you know, try to get your handle for coding. Um, clean code is really important and employers will notice that as well. So if you can look up, you know, how to make my code look nice or clean for industry, that would probably be something that would go a long way. Yeah, definitely. I think like uh, for my third co-op when I was at CHOP, they stress documentation. They were like, unless you do documentation, we will not give you another project to work on. So um, I definitely agree and concur with that. Um, so in terms of like data science, data science as a field, do you think that it's going to evolve more than it has right now? And what do you see yourself doing in the future as a data scientist? Is it the same things that you're doing right now or handling different technologies in the future? And how do you kind of cope up with that pace? So how I think it's going to evolve in the future. Um, I think that data science is going to continue. I think that it's going to expand by um, having a lot of people try to interpret many of these algorithms, which they already are starting to, you know, people are trying to, there might be a neural net and people are trying to encode what features are actually impacting it more or, you know, with, with less complex algorithms. I think the interpretability, interpretability is going to be really big, especially in, in the finance space. But I can see that also in, in hospitals. And um, I think that one of the ways that things are going to go is there's going to be a lot more open source. I think that with the current um, COVID crisis, there are so many data scientists that are banding together and putting open data sets up for things like that. I think that for the healthcare space, that's going to really continue. Um, it, it will definitely be industry specific. And then where do I see myself in the future? Um, that's a tricky one. I ask myself that all the time. So I would really love to be you know, I'd love to get to the point where I don't have to Google anything anymore and I can just know it. Um, I'm definitely a far ways from there, but uh, I hope that one day in the future, but the continuous learning is really important. So I'm constantly reading articles or if someone sends me over a textbook, I, I try to read them. Um, right. 
Medium and Towards Data Science are two great websites that I look up to keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the future, um, I really liked making project plans for some of our interns and you know helping them through that. So I feel like in the long term, you know, I'd love to get a lot more senior and, and technical and understand all of the coding and then mm -hmm. maybe help others do that in the future. Definitely, that makes sense. We have a lot of questions in the chat now. Okay, awesome. Uh, Toby asks, do you have any advice in learning machine learning theories and algorithms? Yeah, so there is another book where the coding is okay, but the, the concepts are really great. It's called um, Elements of Statistical Learning. Uh, I think if you Google ISLR, it's also a free textbook. That's how I learned all of the main machine learning principles. And so it goes through uh, decision trees and um, feature selection algorithms and different things and it has really good description. So I would say if you code in R, like you can look at the code, but regardless of the coding, the concepts there are, if you know that book, you know, I have my notes from grad school that I look back on and that's been so helpful. Right. Definitely. And uh, Kelly has another question. I have heard several contrasting opinions regarding needing a master's degree or PhD to become a data scientist. Being a data scientist, what is your view and experience with this issue? So I think it definitely depends on the industry you're in and, and what type of data science role you want. So for example, you know, if you want to be creating the, the novel algorithm that's never been created at Google Brain, you probably need a PhD. If you want to um, apply algorithms that exist to really applied fields, you probably don't. You just have to have a lot of critical thinking and being able to understand the environment you're in. And so, however, so I got a master's degree and that really introduced me to data science. I don't think I'd be where I am without it um, because I didn't know about it as undergrad. And I think that was really valuable for me for learning. I don't think that everyone needs it though, but it's definitely industry specific and the type of data science role. So, you know, there's the folks creating their own algorithms from scratch, which, you know, I'm not necessarily one of those folks. I've done it before, but that's not my, um, that's not what motivates me. I really like the, you know, applying algorithms to unsolved problems portion. And that, as long as you, you understand, you know, math coding and you can learn the subject matter, mm -hmm. that's really the biggest thing. So, I guess I would recommend grad school. I thought it did wonders for me, but it's definitely not a requirement. You just have to prove yourself in an interview that you'll be able to learn. You know, a lot of PhD students are hired because employers know that they can learn whatever subject matter expert expertise, you know, not necessarily because their PhD thesis is on exactly what, like we had an intern who was a PhD student last summer who was a computational neuroscience PhD has nothing to do with finance and he did a great job just because he can learn, you know, but as long as you can prove that that's the biggest thing. Yeah, and I think a lot of undergraduate um, colleges, they still haven't had data science as an undergraduate major. I think Drexel is one of the few colleges that does offer data science as a undergrad major. So definitely like um, going into the this Drexel is at their best game right now, but um, yeah, I definitely agree that you have to pick and choose depending on what you want to do in the future. Um, one last question that we have, uh, due to the COVID-19, we will have a virtual internship. How do you handle and manage virtual working environment? Any advice for them? Yes, so uh, our team has gone remote now for the foreseeable future as well. And we actually onboarded uh, a Drexel co-op during this time. So um, I guess best advice is, you know, day one, try to meet people on the team and go on a video call. Many teams will have a stand up or, or something like that where you can introduce yourself and, you know, in your first week or two, try to make 15 minute meetings with different people who are on your team just to kind of get to know them as you would, you know, next to the coffee machine at an office. So, you know, try to put your best foot forward in, you know, introducing yourself because then folks will will not be as uh, intimidated to go message you out of the blue. Not that they should, but you know, having that initiative is really good. And you know, especially with virtual meetings, I'm noticing that everyone's more on time. So you know, try to be on time for your meetings. You don't necessarily have to be early anymore, which is good. <laughs> you know, it's the start of them. And so, um, 
And yeah, I guess those are the biggest pieces of advice. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, so we're at time and I think we're all good with our questions. So I just wanted to thank you again for coming here and giving us a better perspective of how it's like to being, uh, of being a woman in data science. Um, and thank you so much for our audience for giving us great questions. Um, do we have anything else to add for your last comments, Carly? Yeah, I guess thanks for having me. And uh, you know, Chelsea has my contact information. If anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to write, reach out. I'm happy to to answer them. And you know, I you know, it's great to see that Drexel has an undergrad data science program, and that our there is this big women initiative. I think it's huge, and it's if people can you know learn about it early on, it just expands it. And I think it's it's really great. So happy happy to be. Hopefully, I can be helpful. You know, and and reach out if if this yep I'm, i know i'm definitely connecting with you and asking you more questions over linkedin um but thank you again um i think it's time to say goodbye now <laughs> well bye everyone thank you again for everything yeah take care everyone yeah be safe see ya